Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on a softly spoken audio adventure into the wonderful world of libraries. If, like me, you love books, especially old and antiquarian books, then you're probably as big a fan of libraries as I am. That wonderful, hushed atmosphere, that amazing scent that you always seem to get in old libraries, which is a sort of mingling of old wood, old paper, dust, and antique leather book bindings. It's such a wonderfully evocative scent that always lifts up your heart, I think, if you're a bibliophile. So, in this talk, we're going to learn a little bit about the history of libraries, and then I'm going to tell you about five particularly beautiful examples that you can visit for yourself. As usual, there will be a selection of images to look at on the accompanying slideshow, but you don't have to look at them if you don't want to. If you prefer, you can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to the wonderful world of libraries. The word library comes from the Latin librarium, which means a chest for books, so it refers to book storage. And the word librarium, in turn, comes from the word liber, which can mean book, but it can also mean paper or parchment. This etymology is interesting because the earliest libraries that we know about didn't actually hold books at all. They were rather storage houses for parchment scrolls, or in some cases even stone tablets because these were the tools that were used to make the earliest records. Currently, the earliest evidence we have of these ancient archive libraries comes from the Sumer region of Mesopotamia in what is now southern Iraq, where archaeologists found a substantial store of clay tablets that date from around 3000 BC and are covered in cuneiform script. And cuneiform is a language that was developed by the ancient Sumerians and it's thought to be one of the oldest languages in the world. So it seems that for as long as we've had writing, we've had libraries. Archaeological excavations in other parts of the world have revealed library archives from ancient Persian, Chinese and Assyrian civilizations. And by the beginning of what we now think of as the Western classical era that started with the ancient Greeks, the concept of the library was already very well established. We know that there were several institutional libraries in Athens and many of the philosophical schools had their own libraries. Plato, Epicurus, Aristotle, they all had their own library collections. And in fact, Aristotle's library was said to be the basis for what is today perhaps one of the most famous of the ancient libraries. And that is, of course, the Library of Alexandria. This library was founded by Ptolemy, who was a friend and a general to Alexander the Great, and who succeeded to his empire after Alexander's death. Ptolemy became the ruler of Egypt. He had his capital city at Alexandria, and he was the one who came up with the plans for the Great Library although he didn't actually live long enough to put them into practice. 
that was done by his son, Ptolemy II, and it was built during the 3rd century BC. The records that were held at Alexandria were kept on papyrus scrolls that were rolled up and placed in little niches, and the library at Alexandria was said to have many, many thousands of these scrolls. It became an epicentre for learning in the ancient world. However, the library didn't last. The apocryphal story goes that it was um, accidentally burnt to the ground by Julius Caesar. However, in reality, historians tend to think that it was damaged by a succession of fires and wars that occurred throughout the Roman era, and uh, it seems that the library had been completely destroyed by about the end of the 3rd century AD. So it lasted about 600 years. The Romans themselves, who were of course great fans of copying everything that the Greeks did, also copied their love of libraries and built several of their own. The Library of Celsus was a famous example that was built in Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. And there were several libraries in Rome itself, including one founded by the Emperor Trajan, which was actually situated in the Roman Forum. After the fall of the Roman Empire, many of these libraries fell into decline and were gradually destroyed. And the era after the Romans in Europe tends to be known as the Dark Ages, but they were actually far from dark in other parts of the world. There were flourishing libraries in Byzantium, as well as Tabriz, and Merv, which was an oasis city located in what is modern-day Turkmenistan. The formation of libraries was particularly encouraged in the Islamic world, and the oldest working library in the world, in fact, is an Islamic library. It's called the al karawian if I've pronounced it correctly, and it's located in the Moroccan city of Fez. It was founded by a woman, Fatima el firia and she was a wealthy heiress, a scholar, and a devout Muslim, who created the library in the year 859 AD. And remarkably, her library's been in continuous use ever since. There were many other antique libraries spread across the Islamic world. Uh, several were concentrated in what is today modern Iran. And there was a grand vizier called Sabin ibn Ahbad, who was a scholar and who was said to have built a public library that contained over 200,000 volumes. It's worth noting as well that Sabine ibn Abad's library was a public library, so it was open to everyone, and that was an extremely advanced concept for the era. It would take many, many centuries for Europe to catch up with that idea of the public library. Most libraries that existed in Europe at this time were actually housed in monasteries and tended to develop out of the collections of books that monks gathered together. There was a particularly large monastic library at the Abbey of Monte Cassino in Italy, and that came about because the Benedictine monks there had a hospital and they wanted to increase their medical knowledge and find new and better treatments for their patients. So over time they gathered together a very large collection of medical texts, and not only did this lead to the forming of a great library, but the monks also copied their books and sent them to other monasteries in order to spread the knowledge. This dissemination of knowledge meant that monastic libraries continued to flourish right through the medieval period, but the rise of more secular libraries, which were usually owned by private individuals, 
didn't really take off until the Renaissance era. And it happened because of the introduction of the printing press. This great innovation had originally been invented in China in the 9th century. But by the 15th century, printing press technology had made its way to Europe. And you had early pioneers of the craft such as Johannes Gutenberg in Germany and Thomas Caxton in England who were beginning to create and distribute printed books. They were still incredibly expensive to buy and very difficult to get hold of, but they were easier to obtain than the hand-copied, beautifully illuminated manuscripts that were being created by the monks. And so the wealthiest people in society were now able to purchase their own books and start their own library collections. Because of this, libraries grew into status symbols, really. You had private collectors such as Cosimo de' Medici and Francesco della Rivera, who created their own libraries, really in order to assert their power and show off their wealth. Universities had also begun to build their own library collections. The first library at the Sorbonne in Paris had actually been founded as early as 1257, and the first purpose-built library at Oxford University in England was established by the Bishop of Worcester sometime in the early 1300s. Interestingly, the Bishop's collection was later amalgamated with a lot of other small Oxford University collections as part of the Bodleian Library, which was created by Sir Thomas Bodley in 1602 and which is still going today. Um, the Bodleian is one of the oldest libraries in Europe. The 17th century saw a big development in library culture as printed books became cheaper and more accessible, and also the principles of the early Enlightenment philosophers began to spread, and they really focused on the pursuit of knowledge and education. As a result of this, there were several great libraries that were formed during this time. Uh, the British Library in London, the Austrian National Library in Vienna, and the library at Trinity College in Dublin were all created around this time, although these new institutions were still only open to scholars or the very highest members of society. They weren't public libraries and uh, universities, monasteries and private collectors alike all guarded their knowledge jealously and didn't offer admittance to ordinary people. In England, there was one notable exception to that rule, which was Cheatham's, a public library that was opened in the mid-17th century, and which I'm going to talk about more later. But it was a real rarity at this time. Libraries on the whole were still only for the most wealthy and privileged members of society. Things began to change in the 18th century, partly because printing books became cheaper and so there was a growth in the number of publishers, but also because the growth in education was beginning to lead to a more literate public, and so the demand for books was increasing. This led to the development of the lending library system, and these libraries were, on the whole, quite small, privately owned concerns that were run as commercial ventures. And they fell mainly into one of two categories. There were subscription libraries, which charged their members an annual fee and tended to be more focused on academic subjects. And then you also had circulating libraries, and these were free to join but they then charged their members a small rental fee for every book that was borrowed. 
circulating libraries were focused less on academia and more on providing the public with the latest best sellers. And consequently, they tended to be particularly popular with middle class women who enjoyed the novelty of having access to new books. As a result, they became quite fashionable places to frequent. And they remained so, really, right through into the beginnings of the 19th century. However, the next change in libraries that came about started in the middle of the Victorian era, when you finally had the beginnings of a more coherent, free public library system. To begin with, these were mainly funded by individual, wealthy philanthropists, who had the noble aim of wanting to provide access to books and learning to everyone. But over time, governments began to realise that this was a good idea, and they started to fund public libraries as well. And many institutions that had once been privately owned were now opened up, finally, for ordinary people to use. That legacy continues today, and most libraries now are publicly funded and open to all, which is rather wonderful for anyone like me who loves submerging themselves in a world of books. Modern libraries are, of course, not just about books these days. Most of them also feature banks and banks of computers, so that users have access to information via the internet. And in this way, libraries have almost gone full circle, I think, because those original libraries that were founded by ancient civilizations were primarily storers and providers of information and records. And that's also largely what modern libraries do today, too. However, when I personally think of a library, I must confess I tend to think of a beautiful old room full of books, preferably with a high and lofty ceiling, rows and rows of wooden shelves, and old desks and tables furnished with chairs and reading lamps. These are the sorts of spaces that I really enjoy visiting. And if you do too, then I'd like to share with you a little selection of what I think are gorgeous libraries that you can visit for yourself. Library 1. Cheetham's I mentioned Cheetham's earlier as being the first public library in England but it also actually has the distinction of being the oldest English-language public library in the world. It's situated in the city of Manchester, in the north of the UK, and it was founded by Humphrey Cheetham, who was a wealthy 17th-century Manchester merchant, and who, excellent man that he was, left a provision in his will for the forming of a public library. Cheetham's has been in continuous use since 1653, and it remains open to everyone. There are more than 100,000 books on its shelves, with many dating from the pre-Victorian era, and the library has had several rather notable readers over the years. Daniel Defoe, the novelist, used to go there. The American politician Benjamin Franklin visited. And perhaps most fascinatingly of all, the philosopher Karl Marx did a lot of his research there for his Communist Manifesto. The library itself is housed in a beautiful medieval sandstone building that has tall mullioned windows, gothic arched doorways, and some stunning vaulted and beamed ceilings. The dark wood bookcases, which were originally known as presses, are lined up in long, tall aisles, and some of them have metal grills on the front to protect the precious volumes inside, although the rarest books are actually hidden away in little alcoves that are protected by tall wooden gates that are kept locked. 
unless you have permission to go in and conduct research. If this seems fairly extreme, it's actually nothing in comparison to some of the oldest books in Cheatham's library, which are actually chained to the shelves, and in some cases have been chained to the shelves ever since the 17th century. It's a beautiful place to visit, perhaps one of the most historic and atmospheric libraries that's open to the public, and stepping inside its hallowed walls is literally like stepping back in time. Library 2. Trinity College. Trinity College is the University of Dublin in Ireland, and it was founded by Queen Elizabeth I, in fact, in 1592. However, the library there, which is known today as the Old Library, was built between 1712 and 1732, and it's a perfect example of a beautiful 18th century Enlightenment library. At the heart of the collection is the Long Room, which, as its name suggests, is an incredibly long room. It measures nearly 65 metres in length, and the shelves rise up over two floors to a very impressive barrel-vaulted ceiling. There are 200,000 books just in the long room itself, and many of these are antique volumes that date from the 18th and 19th centuries. The bookcases are arranged in stalls that flank long straight aisles, and dotted along these aisles are rows of marble busts that depict the heads of great writers and philosophers from history. So you have a marble head of Shakespeare, and there's also one of Socrates, Homer, Milton. All the greats are represented, and the room exudes a quality of majestic scholarly endeavour that I find rather enchanting. However, the most precious manuscript that's held at Trinity isn't actually in the long room, but is kept downstairs in the treasury, and that's the Book of Kells. This is an amazingly fragile, illuminated manuscript of the New Testament Gospels that dates from around 800 AD and is one of the oldest books in the world. So that's a very special item in the Trinity Old Library collection, and I would definitely recommend going to visit it. Library 3. The Austrian National Library. The Austrian National Library is located in the heart of the beautiful city of Vienna, and it's an astonishingly opulent library. Originally, it was a private royal collection that was founded by the Habsburg dynasty, and it's housed in a wing of the Hofburg Palace that was built especially by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI to house the library. The building itself is incredible. It's decorated in an exuberantly sumptuous Baroque style and it has marble floors, painted ceilings, and an absolutely magnificent state hall that's over 80 metres long and 20 metres high. This hall takes your breath away when you enter it. It's jaw-dropping in its grandeur. It has this cavernous domed ceiling that's heavily decorated with frescoes, and it has walnut bookcases adorned with gilt bronze fittings, and also four stunningly beautiful 18th century Venetian globes. So when you walk into this library, you're immediately overwhelmed by splendour. But behind all the luxurious ornamentation, this is at heart a great library. It contains over 12 million items, including thousands of antique books, a superb map and globe collection, 
and it even has an archive of incredibly rare and ancient papyrus scrolls and clay tablets. The library was nationalised in 1920 and it's now open to the public. So today, you can visit it for yourself and experience this extraordinary wealth of literature, art and culture. Library 4 The Royal Portuguese Cabinet of Reading While the Austrian National Library is an absolute monument to Baroque magnificence, the Royal Portuguese Cabinet of Reading which is to be found in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro, is an equally impressive and spectacular library, which is dedicated not to the Baroque, but to the Gothic style. It was founded in 1837 by a group of Portuguese immigrants to Brazil, and the current library building was constructed in the 1880s. It's a joyful example of Gothic Revival architecture, and it has a central reading room, which is a vast hall, lined with Gothic bookcases that rise up not one, not two, but three stories high, and just create the most magnificent impact when you walk into the room. There's also a huge skylight set up into the ceiling, which is decorated with stained glass and is the setting for a huge and intricate chandelier. The shelves themselves are filled with thousands of old volumes, beautifully bound in coloured leather and stamped with gilded titles. And this is really a dream library, in a way. It's a gothic fantasy that almost seems more like a film set than a real library, it always reminds me of something out of Harry Potter. And it has this rich and unique atmosphere that is really rather magical. Library 5. Harewood House. For my final library selection, I wanted to choose an English country house library because nearly every stately home in the UK has a library of some sort or other, and I have a particular fondness for these quiet, book-lined rooms. It has to be said that not all of these libraries are actually about the books. When you walk around, you can clearly tell that some of them have been created as showpieces rather than as genuine libraries where the owners would actually want to sit and read. However, there are many country house libraries that have obviously been built by genuine bibliophiles, and uh, I've actually already made some videos about quite a few of them. Uh, if, like me, you like country house libraries, then you might want to check out the talks I've done on Chawton House. Hatfield House and Abbotsford, because all of them feature fantastic libraries. However, the country house library that I want to talk about now is at Harewood House in West Yorkshire, and I've chosen Harewood because it actually has three full-size libraries. There's the old library, the main library, and the Spanish library which is my particular favourite. Harewood House itself was designed and built by Robert Adam, the noted neoclassical architect and designer, and consequently all three of the libraries feature beautiful Adam decorations, fine plasterwork, gorgeous ceilings, and they have that sort of exquisite elegance that's synonymous with Robert Adam's style. However, the Spanish Library has something else as well, because it's named after some rather sumptuous 17th century Spanish leather wall coverings, which are tooled in brilliant emerald green and gold, and which give the library a wonderfully cosy and rich atmosphere. The wall coverings are actually older than the library itself, 
because the room wasn't converted into a library until the 19th century, when the Victorian architect Sir Charles Barry was called in to remodel the room. He added a rather delightful touch to the new library scheme, because hidden away within the bookcases are two secret doors that are disguised as bookshelves and that are actually pretty difficult to spot unless you know where they are. I absolutely love this detail about the Spanish library. The combination of secret hidden passageways, beautiful leather-bound books, gorgeous decoration, and the juxtaposition of a comfortable-looking old sofa and a fireplace big enough to hold a roaring blaze makes this, in some respects, my ideal library. I think I could quite happily spend hours and hours curled up on that sofa, reading the wonderful books in the Spanish library. That brings us to the end of this talk on libraries, and I do hope you've enjoyed exploring this wonderful topic with me. I hope, too, that you can join me again soon for another softly spoken audio adventure. Until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.